Manchester's history is a story of the Industrial Revolution. Its proximity to the expanding canal network and coal mines in the 18th century meant that the town, which was small at that time, was well-placed to benefit as a market for textile manufacturers. By the time of the Victorian era, Manchester had grown rapidly as a centre of manufacture and an important cotton processor, so much so that it became known as Cottonopolis, or Warehouse City. Huge numbers of people from England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland poured into Manchester, which became a city in 1853, from the countryside to find work in industry. In 1901, its population stood at around 700,000. Only London and Glasgow were greater in size. Manchester became known for its industrial might and as a beacon of innovation. Its rapid growth in population, however, resulted in many symptoms associated with unplanned urbanisation, not least overcrowding in poorly constructed and unsanitary housing. The golden age of grand municipal buildings, arts and culture that attracted tourists from all over the world masked an altogether different Manchester, a grim city of smoking chimneys set amongst the crunching gears of industry, with many of its people living in terrible dirt, poverty and squalor. In fact, Friedrich Engels, sent to Manchester by his father to complete his training in the cotton industry, was so moved by the dystopian scenes he found that he wrote about the conditions of its working class. He described Manchester's old town, England's second city and the first manufacturing city in the world as hell upon earth. It is this dark industrial landscape into which an investigative journalist, Robert Sherrard, arrived concerned with the conditions in which the very poorest lived in Britain's towns and cities. He resolved to expose squalor with a view to seeking improvement. In 1900, he started out on his journey, dressed in working-class clothes, living in modest lodgings, and eating the same food as everyday people. Sherrard obtained his information from the very people who were suffering appalling living conditions. Today, you will hear his account of what he discovered on Manchester's filthy streets. Wretched poverty, gambling, terrible food, hungry children, and the ever-present escape of the dram shop. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. I think of all the cities I have visited, Manchester, with its infinite suggestions of gloom and distress and human suffering, is the most distressing. Is it the climate which produces this effect? What more sinister picture, for instance, could the mind of a Verishagan or of a Degru conjure up than the black depths of the Irwell, seen through the iron gratings opposite the Palatine Hotel, when the afternoon sun swathed in Manchester fog and smoke, hangs over Dean's gate like a disc of livid fire. Such was the scene that I looked upon one afternoon ere turning my steps towards Millgate, on the way to Angel's Meadow. Before that I had wandered about strange ways and the Jewish quarter, in an atmosphere of fog and rags, with mud underfoot and on every side, in the miserable little shops as on the faces of the poor, muttering at the street corners. I had taken in evidences of such painful distress that the mighty pile of the assize courts and of the adjoining jails seemed a monument less of justice than of oppression. For it must be hard, indeed, to live an honest life where life is so hard, where temptations of every kind abound, and it occurred to me that if the streets and the houses were cleaner and brighter, and if the number of dram shops were much less, the assize courts might be less imposing, and the prison less formidable. But here, too, human charity does what it can to render less painful the associations of this dreadful place. And as I passed the huge gateway, behind which are the cells and the lash and the gallows. I remembered a pleasant sight I had witnessed there early one morning during my first visit to Manchester. Close upon 17,000 prisoners pass through the gates of Strangeways Jail every year. And in the mornings, at half-past six in summer and at half-past seven in winter, you may see, collected round the gateway, a group of ladies and gentlemen, 
agents of various charitable societies waiting for the prisoners to come out. There are ladies from the prison gate mission, from the religious institute, and from the central hall. The women are released first, and to them welcoming hands are outstretched. Those who will can be accompanied to the mission rooms, where breakfast awaits them, and where, whilst breakfasting, they are prayed to and conversed with. The men come out a little later, and are entertained in the same way. Efforts are made to find work for both men and women. Reverting to the drink question, it may be noted that a few months ago the secretary of the Discharged Prisoners' Aid Society, female branch, stated to a correspondent of the Manchester Guardian that in nearly every case which the society has had to deal with, intemperance was the primary cause of the prisoner's downfall. Gambling has also much to answer for in the misery of so many Manchester homes. Backing horses seems as common here amongst women as in Newcastle. In the smoke rooms of the licensed houses little else than the races was being talked about. And, curious to relate, the Manchester police seem very tolerant to even more dangerous forms of gambling. For instance, is it not rather difficult to believe that during Manchester Race Week, three card trick men were allowed openly to ply their notorious swindle in the public omnibuses? I saw a lad robbed of over thirty shillings by such a gang. Patriotism, by the way, is now being worked by these sharpers as an additional bait, and you are no longer invited to find the Queen of Spades, but General Baden-Powell instead. To what base uses indeed has come the hero of Mafeking? My visit to Angel Meadow was to visit the Doss houses where the homeless poor and the tramps find shelter. I found some difficulty in getting out of the district at all, it came on to rain heavily, and I cried in vain to get a cab. Not likely, said a handsome cab driver to me. Not likely that I'll take my cab up there to have it bashed in with bricks. I fancy the man must have had other reasons for objecting to the fair, because though I subsequently spent some hours in various parts of the Angel Meadow district, and went into more than one common lodging house, I did not meet with any hostility on the part of the people. I found the Manchester fourpenny lodging houses, as a rule, cleaner and more orderly than those I have visited in other cities, and I understood that in none of these houses may any intoxicating liquor be brought in. It is true that most of the lodgers did not seem to require any additional stimulant. In one of these houses there are beds for over four hundred people. Various tramps with whom I conversed expressed great horror of the Manchester spikes, workhouse casual wards, and I heard many references to the outrage at Crumpsall Workhouse, where a wretched pauper lunatic was brutally done to death by an attendant now in penal servitude. A case which has called forth a special order from the Home Secretary regulating the notification of all the deaths of pauper lunatics in Union workhouses. Both in Angel Meadow and in Ancoats I heard splendid accounts of the work done in these districts by the Wesleyan Mission. In connection with this mission, there is a men's labour yard and casual ward. Every morning scores of outcast men apply at the central hall, the headquarters of the mission, for relief and shelter, and are interviewed by the head of this department, Mr. Sackett. Two approved applicants a card is handed, which entitles them to admission to the labour yard at two o'clock in the afternoon. Wood chopping is done in this yard, which is managed and appointed in a way similar to the church labour home in Liverpool. Every man has to work till five o'clock, by which time he is expected to have earned enough to have paid in advance for his supper, his bed and his breakfast. If a man chops and ties fifty bundles of firewood in the allotted time, he is considered to have given a fair equivalent for the accommodation to be received. Mr. Sackett, whom I interviewed in his office at the Central Hall, described the men as most willing. I have, he said, a high admiration of the tramp class that come into our hands, and of their anxiety to work. Our system, you see, differs from that of the casual ward in the workhouses. Our men work before they are accommodated, which is as much as to say that they pay in advance for what they get. They are not humiliated with the thought that they are receiving charity, Last year as many as 738,197 bundles of firewood were chopped and bundled in the Hood Street labour yard. 
Casuals are allowed to spend two nights at the Wesleyan Casual Ward, seeking for work during the mornings. There is also a night refuge for women in Great Ancote Street. Another society in connection with the mission is the Aggressive League, whose object it is to waylay drunken men and to endeavour, with aggressive persistency, to induce them to reform their ways. But many pages of a book might be devoted to a description of the various branches of good work which is being done in the wilderness of Manchester by this mission whose annual report fills a volume of over 300 pages. In a recent issue of this most interesting publication, an account was given of the kind of food on which very poor families live in Manchester. As to food, it runs. It was a common sight to see a large family sit down to a dinner of potato hash, costing at the outside the sum of sixpence, spent as follows. Meat, threepence. Potatoes, twopence halfpenny. Onions, one halfpenny with plenty of water, or as they call it, dip. Whole families often lived on sixpence a day. In many cases, the slum dwellers obtain everything on credit, for which they have to pay extra, thus a halfpenny a loaf on bread, a farthing on sugar, and a halfpenny on tea. This means often two shillings a week where there is a large family. This is very serious where there is only sixteen or seventeen shillings a week coming in. The textile trade seemed in as depressed a condition in Manchester as, in another branch, it was found by me in Bradford, this owing to the wars. I heard of houses in the habit of sending so many thousand pieces a week to the east which are sending nothing at all. The workers are, of course, the worst sufferers, and many hundreds of hungry men and women were playing in the streets of Manchester. But on this point I have no exact statistics, for the Secretary of the Textiles Workers' Association was absent each time I called, and I can only repeat the vague assertions I had from workpeople, commercial travellers, and such. In other trades in which women are engaged in Manchester and the district, and this is information which I obtained at the office of the Women's Trade Union Council, the wages paid do not compare very favourably with other centres, a girl working in the cigar trade, and it will be remembered that there is much drinking amongst this class of workers, during an apprenticeship of three to five years, earns from five to twelve shillings a week. A skilled worker can earn from seventeen to twenty shillings a week when working full time. There are from four thousand to five thousand women employed in the tailoring trade in Manchester, and allowing for the slack season, their average weekly wages do not exceed nine shillings. They are subjected to the same customs of the trade as the tailoresses of Leeds. The Song of the Shirt, a poem written in 1843 about a seamstress living in wretched conditions, is sung nightly in hundreds of garrets and cellar kitchens throughout Manchester and Salford, and at the usual price for the doleful tune. Eight or nine shillings a week, but never more than twelve shillings, is what women earn in making aprons in Manchester, minus, of course, the cost of the sewings, the price of light, and the rent of the sewing machine, which usually amounts to one shilling sixpence. A competent worker can make forty-eight aprons a day, at sixpence the dozen, seven or eight shillings a week, with the customary deductions, is earned by pinafore makers, while makers of underclothing average from five to nine shillings a week. A tailor's machinist can earn from eleven to fourteen shillings a week, machining trousers, retailed at thirteen shillings a pair, at the rate of sixpence each. On the other hand, rent is high in Manchester. How difficult it is even for a man in regular employment in Manchester to make both ends meet, in view of the cost of rent and the lowness of wages, was impressed upon me by a painful scene which I witnessed at London Road Station. As I was taking the train to Nottingham on the last flight but one of my squalid journey, a respectable workman was seeing his wife and little daughter off, all burst out in piteous crying at the moment of final parting. Afterwards, when the woman had become more composed, she explained, "'We have never been parted before, and now we are to be separated for months and months.' We have had to give over our housekeeping, and I am going back to my father. My husband is a mason's labourer, and can earn five and a half pence an hour. Our rent was five shillings sixpence. How poor she was was shown a little later, when she exclaimed, Oh, but a cup of tea would do me good, and put a little heart into me. But how can I afford the fourpence? There was a tailor-master in the compartment, who had told me that, 
Supposing a girl's quick with her fingers, she can make seven shillings a week at the buttonholes in my shop, who hereupon produced a flask, and, turning to the crying woman, said, Have a drop of scotch, my dear.'